All right, so we have been studying Amos, we're to chapter 8. And of course, just to review real quickly, we have Amos who was from the southern kingdom. He was from Judah. He was called by God. He was just an ordinary shepherd, uh, a, a tender of sycamore trees, and God called him to go to the northern kingdom and preach against their sins. And when he gets there, uh, he preaches against their neighbors, uh, Gentile, and then working their way into uh, Judah. Uh, and then... Uh, against Israel's sins, and that was a, uh, a way to uh, get their attention um, by pointing out everybody else's sin, and then they're like, oh, well, you're, you're just like them. You, you, you're worse. Uh, and then we have these, uh, these oracles or, or, or announcements uh, by Amos against uh, Israel, and then we have, uh, we're in what is the visions now. And so chapter 8 um, we will be talking about the fourth of five visions that God reveals um, to Amos about his patience with the sinful nation of Israel. And so, um, if we could, let's get somebody to read Acts chapter 8, verse 1, please. I'm Amos chapter 8, verse 1. Acts chapter 8 is a good one, but Amos is too. I took a nap, but you can't tell, don't guess. Um, Amos 8 1, please. So, thus the Lord God showed me, and so he's indicating the authority, and he's done this uh, in the previous visions. Thus the Lord God has showed me. You see that in, in uh, chapter 7, verse 1, chapter 7, verse 4, chapter 7, verse 7. And this time the prophet was shown a what? A basket of fruit. Now, according to the calendar of the time, summer fruit was harvested in the last month of their agricultural year. And so that would have been around August, September. And the term summer fruit um, could include figs, grapes, pomegranates, and it's and it's kind of interesting. He shows him summer fruit with figs, and he was a tender of sycamore trees, sycamore figs. But... Um, so he shows him this basket of summer fruit. Let's learn, let's learn why. What's the significance of this? So somebody read verse 2, please. And he said, Amos, what you see. So I said, a basket of summer fruit. And then the Lord said, Amos, what you see. And he said, All right. So just like in the third vision, God has asked Amos, what do you see, Amos? And Amos identifies that he sees a basket of summer fruit. And then God says, the end has come for my people of Israel. And understand that the original language here, and I have it, I have it pulled up, God here is using uh, a play on words. You know, one of the more famous ones that we think about is in Matthew 16 when uh, our Lord is talking to Peter and uh, and Terrence helped me, but I didn't prepare to talk about this, so, but it just popped in my mind. But uh, Peter's name, and then upon this rock I build my church. And there's a play on words between Peter's name and rock because the words are similar. Uh, and here you see, uh, you see something very similar as well. And so the word for summer fruit, and I just like doing this, it just adds a little something to it. Well... If I turn the sound off. Caiaps. Strong's H, 7,019. Caiaps. 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 Is the word for summer fruit. And then the word for end. Strong's H, 7,093. Cates. Case. Caius and Cates. Um, and so there's a play on words here. Um, and the summer fruit stood for the end. It stood for the coming destruction of the northern kingdom. The ripeness of the summer fruit suggested Israel's ripeness for judgment. 
Uh, and this idea, it, it's captured in the NIV uh, translation, uh, which reads, The time is ripe for my people Israel. Israel was ready for destruction. The statement, I will spare them no longer. It's also repeated uh, from the third vision in, in chapter 7, verse 8. So a God here again implies that his patience has come to an end. The time has come for him to act in justice and wrath to punish his people. Um, and then, you know, just to reiterate, do we ever want to be in that position? No, absolutely not. And it, 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 it should go without saying. But yet, we, we you know, I, I heard a chuckle, but they probably didn't want to be in that position, but where, where do they look up and find themselves? Uh, you know, you, 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 Let's never, again, I've, I've said this before, let's never become complacent. We've got to be diligent in the practice of our faith and the observance of God's will. Somebody read verse 3, please. Thank you, ma'am. And so death was to dominate the day of God's wrath. Uh, people were to mourn their dead. You know, their, their joyful songs of the, the temple or the palace uh, would become wailing and it would become weeping for those who have died. Uh, the sound of hope uh, would turn into the howling chants of, of lament, lamenting and, uh, and corpses would pile up in the streets. It, it, they would not be buried. It would just be thrown out. The gruesome task would be done in silence. Um, just understand just the, the visual representation that, that is, being, is being created for us here in these words. Uh, it is not something that we should ever want to move towards. And he is trying to get these people to wake up and understand the error of their ways. And of course... You know, we've talked about this. Uh, seek God. Seek good. Uh, ver chapter 12, chapter 4, verse 12 says, Prepare to meet thy God. Um, and so this is this vision that God has given him. Verse 4, Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail. So here again, Amos is returning back to one of the sins that has been uh, uh, levied against them, or attributed to them, of mistreating the poor. And so he gave the reason for the wailing mentioned in 8.3. God's patience had given way to punishment. And again, God emphasized that Israel's sin related to the mistreatment of the humble, mistreatment of the needy, the helpless, uh, and they were... There was crooked businessmen, corrupt leaders that would take advantage of them. Matter of fact, in, in this, it, uh, it is specifically talking about crooked businessmen. Somebody read 8.5. So, what did those businessmen do wrong? They could hardly wait until the new moon and the Sabbath were passed so they could get back to business of cheating the poor. Now, the new moon refers to a religious festival. Let me see if I have it pulled up real quick. Um, Numbers chapter 28, verse 11. At the beginning of your months, you shall present a burnt offering to the Lord. Two young bulls, one ram, and seven lambs in their first year without blemish. Verse 12, three-tenths of an ephah, a fine flour, of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil. For each bull, two-tenths of an ephah, uh, of fine flour as a grain offering mixed with oil. For the one ram and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering for each lamb, as a burnt offering of sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Verse 14, their drink offering shall be uh, half a hen of wine for a bull, one-third of a hen for a ram, and one-fourth of a hen for a lamb. This is the burnt offering for each month throughout the months of the year. Also, one kid, 
one kid of goats as a sin offering to the Lord shall be offered besides the regular burnt offering and his drink offering. And David said, to, uh, and then skipping to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 20, verse 5, and David said to Jonathan, indeed, tomorrow is the new moon and I should not fail to sit with the king to eat, but let me go that I may hide in the field until the third day at evening. Uh, if your father misses me, then say, David earnestly asked permission of me that he might run over to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the family. So this is this religious festival. Numbers 28 kind of describes what's supposed to happen. 1 Samuel 20 refers to uh, it happening in the day of Samuel. And so on such occasion, these businessmen, because they could hardly wait until the new moon and Sabbath. They're, what were their minds? In their pockets, on the money. Uh, where should their minds have been? Huh? On the Lord, on God, on, on, on their worship. And of course, we've talked previously about how uh, they went through the motions, but their heart was not in it. And so... Um, they observe these holy days without any feeling, any real gratitude for what God had done for them. Um, and when the holy day was over, they went back to their dishonest business practices because it talks about what they did. The merchants portray, uh, portrayed here were guilty of using dishonest weights and measures. And of course, you know, you always see like the scale of justice. And of course, how, how did that used to, they had like a, a known weight, and then you'd put that on there, and then you'd measure out something, and you'd get them to balance, and then you knew that what you measured out was the same, when it balanced, was the same weight as the known weight. And so what they did was they made uh, a bushel smaller and a shekel bigger. And so basically what they did was is, is they used a heavier weight to measure out the the, the grain and, and what have you, and then they used a lighter weight to measure out the money. So that, so that they, they cheated you coming and going. <laughs> um, we read about Esau, that's the Hebrew word. Uh, in some translations, it's translated bushel. And basically, it works out to about 5.8 gallons. Uh, it's a dry measurement, but about, about 5.8 gallons. Yeah. Pressed to its full measure. There's one uh, talking about. I can't. I can't remember that. But I know what you. I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't remember the, the chapter and verse. But and so they overcharged those who bought wheat for them because they they measured the wheat. They sold in bushel baskets were smaller than uh, the real bushel. And when these merchants weighed the money given to them, they used dishonest scales. And so these customers they paid exorbitant prices. Uh, because of these, these practices. And, and, and these practices, they weren't just unique to Israel. There's uh, historical documents from the time. Um, in the, the Egyptians, uh, there's a document entitled The Instruction of Amun Imhotep. Uh, it says, do not lean on the scales nor falsify the weights, uh, nor damage the fraction of a measure. The Code of Hammurabi uh, the, uh, from ancient Babylonia uh, also addressed these. It says, if a merchant lent grain or money at interest, and when he lent it at interest, he paid out the money by the small weight and the grain by the small measure. Uh, but when he got it back, the, got the money by the large weight and the grain by the large measure, uh, that merchant shall forfeit whatever he lent. So they, they, you know, somebody being a cheat in business, there's always that person, you know? <laughs> uh, and it wasn't unique to, uh, it wasn't unique to Israel. And then what I read, it says, do not lean on the scale. Let me tell you something. If you want to have fun with your special loved one, if they ever get on the scale and weigh, sneak up behind them and just put your toe on it. And, and then, you know, they, they will get really excited. And, and, and you can just think about how, how, how <laughs> I'm getting so many looks right now. <laughs> oh, okay, moving on. Amos 8, uh, verse 6. Somebody read that real quick, please. <laughs> Somebody. 
So in their profiteering, thank you, Joe, the dishonest businessmen probably overcharge the poor so that they become debtors and eventually they're slaves. And uh, they traded in human beings and they bought the helpless for money and the needy for a pair of sandals. And we see that early on in chapter 2, verse 6. Uh, this is a reference back to that. And so besides that, uh, they were guilty of false advertising, a deceptive merchant. They sold the, the refuse of the wheat. So bad wheat, they were selling like the chafe off the floor uh, as if it were quality grain. And so they just, and so God here is, is, is through Amos, is showing their sins. Uh, and it just, you know, you get the idea that they had become uh, as a people, as a nation, morally corrupt throughout. Now, I'm sure there was individuals who this did not apply to, uh, and, and there would be that remnant that we talked about, and every time I think about it, I think about Joe's goat. But uh, that, if y'all remember anything else, it's going to be, there's going to be, Amos said there's going to be a remnant, and it's going to be Joe's goat. Or maybe I'm paraphrasing, I don't, you know, but. Uh, somebody read verse 7, please. All right, so the results of Israel's sin, Amos said that God had sworn to never forget any of their works or any of their deeds. Uh, now, who in here wants to be in the same position? Who in here, looking back at everything you've done in your life, would, would want God to not forget what we've done? I, uh, I, I don't want to be in that position. Um, and thank goodness that's not part of the new covenant today because when we, when we obey the gospel, when we ask God for forgiveness and repent of our sins, it's like the slate is wiped clean. But here they had gotten so corrupt they said God would never forget. Um, the pride of Jacob, it probably refers to, to God himself because it, it, it says the Lord has sw sworn by the pride of Jacob. And we've studied in earlier uh, verses where uh, God swore by himself because there was nothing more powerful to swear by than God himself. You can see that in, in uh, chapter 4, verse 2, and chapter 6, verse 8. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's why that's why I've made this a, a, a recurring theme in this lesson is be diligent and and don't become complacent because it's so easy to do and and and, and I've been guilty and I think other people have been guilty of looking back and going, man, how could they mess up so bad? You know, how could how could they mess up so bad? Well, it, it happened easy enough. And, and, and it could happen to us as well. And don't, there shouldn't be a person in here, uh, as hard as you try to, to please God, that we should ever become comfortable. Um, you know, now not, and again, I want to be clear and offer a balanced message is there is hope of redemption through Jesus Christ. And so therefore there is joy in Christ. Um, but we do have a responsibility. And I think that one of the chief lessons here is that they become lax, they got away from God, and, and you, you know, you don't just, with the exception of Jonah where he tried to go as far as he could, you know, people don't typically get away from God in one big step. It's just a little, it just a little. It's just incremental movements, and then you know, one day, uh, you know, one day you, you you commit a what man would call a little sin, and then the next day it's a little bit easier, and you do, you know, and then you look up and 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 you're not serving God, you're not acting in a manner that pleases God. Um, I don't think that this, and this is my opinion, uh, but I, this didn't happen to them overnight. Um, and so, somebody read uh, verse 8, please. Uh, 
Thank you, ma'am. And so, verse 8, we're told that because of Israel's sins, God was going to cause the land to quake, and he's going to make the people mourn. There was going to be severe damage and loss of life from this earthquake that would result uh, in great mourning. And this earthquake is described, it would rise and fall the same way that the, the Nile rose and fell in Egypt. Uh, and of course, if you remember from your Sunday school lessons, why did everybody go around the Nile to farm? because of the silt from the Nile flooding, and it would wash the, the silt out, it would make the land fertile. And, and, then, and, and by the way, if you ever, so we have Google Maps, we have Google Earth. Uh, just, just as an exercise, just to kind of put that in your mind, go and Google uh, Egypt and look for where the Nile comes out into, and yeah, Gary. Yeah. When you obey the gospel, the slate is wiped clean. And if you should fall away but return to God and ask for forgiveness and repent of those sins that you've committed, the, sl the slate is washed away again by the continual renewal of the blood of Christ. Um, and so, but where I was going with that is just if you want to get a sense of what Egypt looked like, because, you know, we always see, and I know I use this probably phrase too much, but we get the coloring sheet version, you know, and we talk about how they, they went to the Nile, and, you know, we, and we talk about how, um, the, you know, especially during the, the story of Moses and the basket in the river, and, and you know, and, and they were farming the Nile. That's, that's when I remember that was introduced. Go to Google Maps or go to Google Earth and, and find the Nile and look where it comes out. Uh, in, into the to the to the Gulf there, and what you'll notice, you know, because when we think of Egypt, we think of the pyramids, and we think of nothing but sand. And what happens is because of that land being fertile, because of the Nile and the fresh water, and also tying this in to Genesis and the story of um, uh, Joseph, that little area would be called Goshen in the day of uh, Jacob, a day, in a day of uh, Joseph, and it is just as green as, as, as you can ask for. Uh, and so just to, just to kind of get your eye, and to this day it's just as green as you can ask for. And so to get your, your, your mind around that, really not relevant to the lesson tonight, but talking about the Nile and how it rose, it made me think about that. But Amos used this figure of an earthquake to picture... Uh, the destruction that was about to fall upon Israel. Now there's some that say that it was figurative language, some that say it was uh, uh, actual. All I know is God is upset with them and it's not going to be good. Absolutely. Verse 9, somebody. All right, so that day refers to what? We've talked about it several times. The day of... Day of the Lord, which will be a day of judgment. 
the day of the Lord is how it's referred to, but it will be a day of judgment. And what was their attitude towards the day of judgment? What did they think, and then what was the reality that was going to be? Uh-huh, and, and of course, clearly we are seeing, Amos is trying to tell them otherwise. And so, you know, talking about the sun going down at noon and I will darken the earth, probably referring to uh, an eclipse, um, and they would have understood this as, as uh, uh, an omen of doom. Um, I'll skip that part. Some, go ahead. Yeah. Verse 10, please. Gary, hold on. Go ahead. Mm hmm. My mind did go there, so I, you know I don't know that it, I don't know that you'd be accurate to call it a parallel, but definitely a very similar situation. You're absolutely right. Verse ten, please. And so God's going to turn their festivals, which they endured we talked about that a while ago they couldn't wait for the new moon couldn't wait for the sabbath you know they endured these festivals so they could get back to their business their crooked business practices and god says i'm going to turn your festivals into mourning uh and and of course you know what what do you think religious festivals were actually like during that time were they a time of mourning no it was a time of fellowship, a time of rejoicing. But when God struck the nation, there would be no joy. There would be no happy songs. And instead, the people would, would, would uh, mourn over their losses. And then, of course, we know we've talked about this. Wearing sackcloth is a way to signify that, that you are mourning um, and then tearing their clothes. And then, uh, out... Uh, and baldness on every head. Does that mean that everybody is going to? Was God going to make uh, uh, follicle damage a, a a punishment of of, of their sins? Um, Somebody, let's see. So, uh, I tell you what. Somebody read Job one twenty. Job one twenty. I've got several verses, but we'll just read that one. <laughs> I don't know if a woman shaved her head back in those days it meant something else so I, I, um, so I'd have to look that up Mike because if a woman shaved her head it was indicating a certain profession so quit snickering on the front row <laughs> Job one twenty. All right, so all of you who get a little less use of your comb, you can rest easy that this is not a punishment, but basically they would shave their head. They would put on this sackcloth. They would tear their clothes uh, as a sign of mourning. Um, and so that is what that is about. And so the sorrow would be widespread and it would be impartial and the mourning would be as intense as the mourning of parents who have lost their only son. Have you ever been to a funeral where a young child has passed away? 
You don't have to be young. The child doesn't have to be young. They say one of the worst pains is a parent uh, outliving their child. And, and I remember uh, a, a friend, uh, and, and you probably know who I'm talking about, but just uh, um, lost, uh, lost, a young, lost a young child in the teenage years. And just uh, the morning, you know, you go to a funeral, it's sad. You go to a funeral like that, and it is absolutely just heartbreaking. Uh, and, you know, just kind of, you know, I'm not being, I'm not being dramatic. It just kind of makes you want to well up right here. So in that culture, too, there was an additional um, weight to losing their only son because it, it's bad enough to lose a child. It's bad enough to lose your only child. But in that culture, the family's land and their other properties were passed down through sons. And so if a family only had one son and that son died, then that line would be snuffed out. Um, somebody read 2 Samuel 18, 18. And of course, Absalom is Dave, one of David's children, King David's children, and he had no son, and so basically his line stopped. And, and, and I assume he built this monument as a memorial to his line, but indeed, the day of the Lord would be a bitter day. You just think about, again, the picture that is being painted for us uh, over the loss of a child, and then you think about their culture and the added, and, and even in today in this culture, you know, I, you know, um, there are some people that still place weight on the family name and carrying it forward, but nothing would remain here but gloom, mourning, lament, hopelessness. Um, verse 11, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, verse for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So as a result of this destruction which God had planned to send, there would be a famine on the land. But it's not going to be the famine that we think about. It's rather going to be a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. The words of God, which provided spiritual substance, which provided everlasting life. Um, and there, it's being compared to food and water. Um, and of course, you think about uh, you think about Jesus uh, at the well with the uh, Samaritan uh, woman. Uh, what did he tell her? What kind of water does he? He provides living water, and so we, we again see that this is a common a common theme. And so in verse eleven, um, people would search for a divine message, but they would receive none. In times of great trouble or national crisis, Israel would turn to the Lord for a prophecy uh, to give them guidance and hope for the future. But they haven't been listening to his word, and so guess what? On this occasion, their appeals to God would go unanswered. Somebody read verse 12, please. The people would stagger throughout the land and go from sea to sea. That would be probably the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea and from uh, north even to the east, so, so probably from Galilee down to the Transjordan area. And like people deprived of the necessities of life, Israel would still be unable to find any word from the Lord. Can you imagine being cut off from God? I mean... Great irony here is seen in these words. The same, because think about it. The same people who rejected the prophets, who told them not to prophesy. Amaziah told uh, Amos in chapter seven not to not to prophesy to go back to Judah. And in that terrible day, when God does deliver His wrath and His judgment. They would be longing from a, for a word from the Lord, but they would not receive any message from him. And, and, and perhaps that's the main idea, is, is that the part of Israel's punishment is God would abandon them because they're not listening to him. 
they've abandoned him. Um, let's see if we can't knock out chapter 8 tonight. We've got about six more minutes. Verse 13, somebody. And so this calamity that was going to fall on Israel, uh, it would affect uh, ages. Not only would the older people suffer, but so would the young and the vigorous. Uh, the fair virgins or beautiful virgins, depending upon your translation, and the young men will faint from thirst. They would be deprived of their basic daily needs. Um, one commentator makes the the the... the likens it to the flower and the glory. The flower being the beauty and the virgins and the glory being the strength of the young men of Israel uh, would not be spared from the disaster um, that would be achieved by their leaders who were the architects of this long and stubborn rebellion against God. And so if the young women and the young men of Israel suffered and died, What's going to happen to the future of Israel? It dies with them. Um, and, you know, <laughs> that's one of the reasons it's so important. Um, it's an, an, additional, an additional reason that it is important to raise up our children and go out and preach the gospel. Um, Verse 14, those who swear by the sin of Samaria, who say, as your God lives, O Dan, and as the way of Beersheba lives, they shall fall and never rise again. The effects of the coming destruction would be felt by the idolaters, because we talked about how there was uh, an idolatrous idol set up in Dan and an idolatrous idol set up in Beersheba. And these worshipers are first spoken of as those who swear by the guilt or the sin of Samaria. Samaria was the capital city of Israel, the, the northern kingdom, but the name here is used to designate the whole northern kingdom. Um, and the term guilt or sin is probably uh, God's way of referring to uh, the northern kingdom. These idolaters were also swearing by the gods of Dan, uh, one of the two sanctuaries set aside uh, by Jeroboam the first for worship of the golden calves. Um, let's see. So any questions, that's a good place to end tonight. That's the last verse. Um, we'll get into some lessons learned next week. But uh, any, uh, any questions? Comments. Mm -hmm. Talking about the day of the Lord again for those who are be for those who have obeyed the gospel and for those who are obedient, what does the day of the Lord look like for them? Everlasting life, a home with with our Father in heaven, um, and so you know. Again, Amos goes to great lengths to paint out the the sins of Israel and talk about the the, the destruction that's coming upon them. But again, you know the the Israelites they they no doubt thought that you know hey we're God's people we got this it's okay well no they didn't have it and the lesson there for us is you know hey we're Christians we're God's people we got this well look how easily they went so far astray we've got to make sure when a sailor sails across the sea what does he do 
He stops every so often. Well, now he checks his GPS, but back in the day, to be more poetic, he, he would, you know, take, take his little device and look up and check his position against the stars, and there would be a course correction. And we've got to have regular course corrections. We've got to constantly, you know, we've got to constantly check ourselves. You know, and, and so, and that's one of the benefits of being in the body of Christ. I, I think that, that being a member of the church, uh, you know, that there is a loving accountability um, and that we can, we can lean on each other and should somebody need to be leaning but not, then, then we can, you know, we have a duty to say, brother, sister, let's, let's look at this. You know, we love you match up what you're doing compared to what God's word says how does that measure out because I think maybe you're kind of shorting God's back to that balance you're kind of shorting God's word and weighing yours a little too heavy you know so absolutely yeah course correction are you volunteering to do the sign Huh? Yeah, I, 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 that's probably implied in that. But yeah, you know, have you ever have you ever done the? I, I'm not I'm not I'm not picking it. I know you're not. I'm just playing with you. But, it, but there's only so much room on that sign. You know, if you've ever if you've ever done the sign, if you've ever done the sign, you have. You, you want to say everything, and and there's there's you can only say like that. Um, so if you if you know me, I'm not a uh, huge public speaker, and, and I'm really out of my comfort zone tonight. So <laughs> so bear with me tonight. But um, I appreciate the encouragement from from Terrence and Van and several that uh, have asked me to uh, several times to get up here and do it, and I finally got the, the courage to get up here and do it. Um, invitation song number fifty tonight. Uh, Brother Terrence will be doing that for us. Um, so. For our invitation tonight, um, I was thinking, and Van and I didn't plan this, but uh, when he was talking about uh, uh, the self-correction uh, and self-reflection there, it, it uh, kind of ties in for um, So with the self-correction and self-reflection, uh, one thing that we need to uh, be aware of is our example. Our example to others, our example to our children, and uh, the way that we conduct ourselves out to the world. Uh, when, when we're out in the world, 
we, we are set apart from, from the world. We are different. We are uh, Christians that are, should hopefully be portraying God. Um, in First Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 12, it says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, with the laying of hands of eldership. Meditate on these things, and give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all, and take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this you will, be, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. So, being an example is very important to everything that we are as a Christian. If we're being the right example, we can bring others to Christ. And but that um, are borderline, let's say those that may be straying away uh, to some degree or another. If we are not solid in what we are in our example then we can be distracting to them. So, for example, uh, I use River as an example. A lot of things that we do around the house, he pits up on. And his mind is a little sponge that, that pits up on everything. And uh, uh, so in the future, if we don't follow up and don't teach the right things to him or to uh, others in the world, then it could, uh, it could lead them astray. And uh, as it says in, Tim in Timothy here, uh, for doing this, it, it will save both yourself and those who hear you. So if we portray that good example to others and bring those others to, to Christ, then it will save both ourselves and, and those that are with us. So uh, with that being said, um, there is many ways that, uh, or there is one way that we can be a good example and that is to, to follow Christ. And that is the only way that we can be that good example. So uh, for those that may need the prayers of the church or those that may need to put on baptism and, and come to Christ, uh, tonight is, is the night to do it. And uh, Mark, 15, or Mark 16, verse 15 and 16 says, And he uh, said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Uh, pay very close attention to that word and. Uh, and is a conjunction word that brings two things together. So you have to believe and be, be, be baptized. So if we don't do both, then we won't be saved. So if you have a need tonight, um, please make that need known. Come forward and or talk to one of us afterwards and we can help you out as much as If you would, stand while we use this song. Have you been to Jesus for Good job. Thank you.
I want to thank everyone for making it out with us tonight. Just need my calendar here, sorry. I always get nervous whenever there's rain because I know it's a good excuse to stay inside and, you know, be scared. But the weather cleared up, so I'm glad everyone can make it out with us tonight. Uh, David just told me a little bit before the announcements. Uh, Brenda is having some back and shoulder issues. She says she's been in bed all day, so uh, be mindful of uh, her. I know she does a lot of calling and checking up on people, so we'll make sure she's doing all right. Um, other events and things like that this evening, I know... On the schedule, originally on the schedule for the 19th was our next Youth Devo. Um, I'll need to get with Marty on that and see if that's still... Check with us on that date. We'll hopefully have more information for you on Sunday, but we'll, uh, we'll set a date that, that might get pushed. But that's what's on the calendar for right now. Um, other announcements, events, updates? Yes, we need to... Was that set at the... 26th? Last Saturday of the month. So that is two weeks from this Saturday. August 26th is the next work day. We moved it because of the Discovery Park trip. Uh, but we've talked about that for a little while. Just a handful of things that need to get done. So August 26th is the, uh, the work day. Anything else? Going once, going twice. Oh, that's right. Yes. Good, yes, yeah, he, there, he was real quiet, I didn't even know it until I was asking Thomas, he was like, oh yeah, he had, but uh, yes, definitely be aware of them as well. Well, um, I guess also just be, yes, yes, she has her specialist visit, and you said that's tomorrow? I think that was this week, so definitely, yeah, hopefully she'll get some answers she's looking for. And I was also just going to say, be praying for all of our teachers and students and folks in the school system. I know we're going back to school. So, um, all right, guys, we'll go ahead and close in a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. God, as always, when we gather together, we're so thankful uh, for this body of believers to, to edify one another, to encourage one another, to, to study your word. We're thankful for the teachers and, and those who help make this these gathering times and these studies possible. I want you to... Just comfort and be with those names and those families that were mentioned tonight. Uh, Miss Brenda, Miss Birdie, Mr. Mr. Wilson and his surgery. But also just all the, all the students and teachers as we go back and get kind of back in the groove of things and deal with new challenges, face new hurdles. I ask that as we kind of get back into our routines, we will remember the people that you've called us to be, God. And that even when we leave here, we will take with us the word that you've given us, the faith that we keep with us, and that... Just it's your will and your word that guides us above all things that we're obedient to, God. As always, when we pray, we're grateful for your Son who died on the cross for our sins. In his name we pray. Amen.